we hear a lot of back and forth about whether or not the gender pay gap is real. Can differences in earning between men and women be explained by differences in hours and productivity? Welcome to the Secret Life of Numbers podcast, the podcast where we dissect everyday numbers and statistics to find the stories behind them. Each episode, we take a number or statistic and break it down. We will tell you where it comes from and what it means for you. Along the way, hopefully we will inspire you to think about the numbers in your own life. I'm LaVanya, your data scientist on call. I'll be breaking down the numbers. I'm Lindsay, your data translator. For when LaVanya gets too technical on us, I'll be breaking down the rest. All right, let's jump in. Whew, big episode today. Yeah, I'm I'm a little nervous about it actually because we're talking about the gender pay gap if it wasn't clear from our opening questions. <laughs> this is an issue or a topic I guess that's a bit more possibly political or controversial in some circles. Yeah. Well, I hope we do it justice. I think that's where the nerves come from for me. And when we first chose this as a topic for season two, Mm -hmm. I was nervous to touch it. Right. Yeah. That's why it's like the last episode in the season. (laughs) (laughs) But I think as we've done, you know, our research for this episode, I've become more and more fired up about it. And I feel so ready to talk about it. You feel ready? I'm still a little nervous, but I'm really hoping to do it justice. Well, we'll talk about this throughout the episode. But one of the reasons why I'm nervous is because I think, like you said, it's just very political. And there are those who don't necessarily believe in the gender pay gap. And it can be polarizing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, too, what's often missing from maybe what's talked about with the gender pay gap is like a really comprehensive overview of the numbers. Mm. Well, I think maybe a good place to start is with a definition of what the gender pay gap is. Definitely. So I pulled this actually from one of the papers that I was reading in my research, and that'll be in our show notes, but I'm going to read it directly. And the paper was titled... Measuring and Decomposing the Gender Pay Gap, a New Frontier Approach. The gender pay gap measures the differences in the wages earned by female workers when compared to male workers. And then they go on to say that accurately measuring the gender pay gap is an important exercise in order to assess how far we are from the ideal of equal pay for work of equal value. Determining the different sources of the gender pay gap is also very important in order to design appropriate policies for eliminating this gap. Yeah, it's so important to know what the gap is before we can even get to a place of closing it. I can tell you what some of the numbers I found for the Canadian gender wage gap. That's another thing. Sometimes this is called the gender wage gap. Sometimes it's called the gender pay gap. Uh, So this is a study put out by Statistics Canada titled The Gender Wage Gap in Canada, 1998 to 2018. And in their highlights section, they said that in 2018, female employees aged 25 to 54 earned $4.13, or 13.3% less per hour on average than their male counterparts. So in other words, these women earned 87 cents for every dollar earned by men. Another one of the highlights here that I think is interesting is the gender gap is in hourly wages has narrowed by $1.04, or 5.5 percentage points, since 1998, when it was $5.17, or 18.8 percent. So I guess what this study is showing is that there is a gender pay gap, Mm -hmm. and it is narrowing over time, but it's still there. It still exists. But I have a question for you. When I say, for example, female employees age 25 to 54, um, and this is their gender pay gap, 87 cents, What do you think about who that number is describing? I think one of the things I wonder about is intersectionality. 
when hearing about the gender pay gap, just kind of in the news or colloquially or before we even kind of decided to do this episode, I often heard that like women of color, for example, earn even less than white women. So I wonder about that, but I also wonder like what job are they doing? What sector is this? So this is one of the things, and I'm glad you brought it up because this is one of the issues that I personally have with the way these numbers are kind of published. It's an overall number. So it's a descriptive statistic. In order to give you this overall number, you lose a lot of information. Like you don't necessarily know if, or younger women, like maybe women 25 to 30 have less of a gap than women age 50 to 54. Or you don't know if women in engineering fields, for example, have more of a gap than women in like administration fields. When you lump it all together like that, it, it gives you, it gives you like big picture, but it doesn't give you the details anymore. I think my other question with it too, kind of going off of that point, is what did they exactly account for in calculating this number? Like, did they account for level of education? Did they account for hours worked? Did they account for productivity measures that are often used? So for example, in sciences, like often publications really matter for career advancement. This is great because now I get to talk about the math. (laughs) So there's like two ways to think about calculating the gender pay gap, an unadjusted way and an adjusted way when I was doing the research. Unadjusted, you would just take the median wage for women divided by the median wage for men. And that's called like a gender wage ratio, right? Because that's the percentage of pay women make of men's pay. So then the gender pay gap is like one minus that difference. Right. So that's kind of just raw values, right? Like nothing else is taken into account, but just wage and gender. Yes. Okay. So when we think about calculating the gender pay gap in an adjusted way, there's a standard used and it's called the Oaxaca blinder decomposition. And we'll go through kind of like the math of this. What happens is you use a logistic regression model. And if you know about logistic regressions, they're used to measure two classes of a variable. So in this case, we're looking at men and women. So in this case, men would be represented by one and women are represented by zeros. You calculate wage using input such as education, whether or not they belong to a union, mobility, these types of things. And you end up with an equation. And then once you have that equation, you can calculate it for men and you can calculate it for women. And then there's like a hypothetical question that you ask. So you say, what if we use the equation for men and we use the female input? So we use the model for men, but like the women's level of education and the mobility of the women and calculate the wages then. And then the difference between that hypothetical situation And the women's model results is an adjusted form of the gender pay gap. Okay, so to give an example, so we have an equation for women with inputs of, let's say, hours, number of years of experience, and education. Yeah. And then we have the same one for men with those three variables. Mm -hmm. For women, let's say we plug in like 40 hours a week, 10 years experience, bachelor's degree, Mm -hmm. you get a number, you plug it in for men, you get a number. Yes. But you say, what if we have a woman Mm -hmm. with those variables in the men's equation? Is that different than if they're put in the women's equation? So you take the women's data and plug it into the men's equation and get the result compared to the women's data in the women's equation. Okay, so we're crossing it over to see if there's a difference between men and women when accounting for these factors. Yeah. And then what's interesting is mathematically looking at those equations, a portion of the gap can be explained, right? Because you can look at the coefficients in those equations for men and women, and you can see, oh, okay, like men and women maybe have different levels of education. And that's important to know because then you can ask why men and women have different levels of education. Maybe more women are part of a union or maybe less women are part of a union, and then you can ask why. Um, But then there will be a portion that you can't explain with the math, and that is also a contributor in the gender pay gap. Right. So the kind of that unknown. And so I guess maybe that's kind of where we see those arguments against the gender pay gap is people bring up things that I think 
are legitimate, right? So like, for example, most of the burden of kind of unpaid labor in a house or of childcare does fall on women. And sometimes that results in women being more often part-time workers than men. And it's like, of course you would earn less if you work part-time versus full-time. But then, like you said, you have to ask, like, why is it the women that are always scaling back? Yeah. So in reviewing the mathematics that are used to calculate the gap or the gender pay gap, the math itself, there will always be error in it. But I think it's a good place to start. Once you look at the math, it'll point you to places where maybe you should pay attention, I would say. If that makes sense. I guess the, the point of this is we need to follow the data to where it's leading us, right? Yeah. And I should say that this method of looking at wage difference between different groups is not new. This method was developed in the 70s when we were looking at wage discrimination based on race. So, Lev, we've talked a bit about how you calculate an adjusted gender pay gap, which accounts for different factors that would affect pay, which makes sense, like hours worked. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other predictors that are put into these models? So this is a good question. And there isn't like a universally accepted standard, at least from what I could tell in my research. And also, as I was looking at Statistics Canada, they mentioned this as well. But I can give you some examples of some of the things that are like often found in these equations. That would be great. I guess every equation is different, but some of the things that are commonly put in. So some of the things that are commonly put in, we'll start with what they call personal characteristics first. So this is presence slash number of children in the household, age of the youngest child in the household, province of residence, productivity enhancing characteristics are sometimes included or probably often included. So these are standardized test scores, highest level of education achieved, work experience. So these are some of the common things that you would see in the equation. Like I've also seen things like whether or not you belong to a union, whether or not you're mobile. Right. And one question that I have is, I've heard about studies that have found that, for example, like presence of children affects men and women differently in terms of their kind of career, in terms of whether or not they pull back, if hours change, whether or not it affects their career. So in the models, like the models for women, the models for men, using kind of these similar inputs, they aren't identical models, right? So like presence of children would have a different influence on the model for men than women. Is that correct? Of course. Yeah. So they would, they would definitely be different. And then that would probably fall into your explained difference or your explained part portion of the gap. Right. So like, I guess an example with the kids would be that like the gap in women's careers that they tend to take after they have a baby, like a maternity leave Mm -hmm. is often very different from until recently, people didn't really even talk about it, like a paternity leave. Yeah. So Like my intuition tells me that if you decide to stay home a little bit longer for maternity leave, then you'll be affected in multiple ways when we look at that math. You'll probably be affected by number of years of work experience. And then if they include like number of children or like youngest age of child in the home, like those inputs will also change in the model. And that will differ from the men's model. Right. And then when we run that comparison, asking the question, what what if we put the women's data into the men's model and look at the difference, we'll probably see that a portion of that difference can be explained by some of those coefficients. Right. So what we're really seeing is that these factors affect men and women differently. Yeah. Like having kids has a different effect on your career if you're a woman than it does if you're a man. Mm-hmm. Kind of painting and broad brushstrokes. Obviously, yes. there's exceptions. Yeah. Of course. In this report, where I pulled some of the numbers for Canadian gender pay gap, so this was titled Measuring and Analyzing the Gender Pay Gap, a Conceptual and Methodological Overview. This is specifically looking at Canadian numbers. One of the things they said was, notably, as the gender wage gap has narrowed over time, nearly 70% of the gender wage gap in 2017 could not be explained by gender differences in province, human capital, union status, public sector employment, occupation, and industry. 
So what's happening is like these like intersectionality factors that you kind of alluded to in the beginning, like that women might decide to stay home for maternity leave. And that has like a very interesting effect on these inputs that are then put into the model. Or we can't see them at all because we don't know what they are. So they never make it into the model. And that remains unexplained. So I guess the broader message here is really that, no, the gender pay gap cannot be explained by productivity and hours, that there's factors going into it that are probably rooted in unconscious or conscious bias or factors that we don't even know about. Yeah, there's a lot of things going on that like we can't explain some of it, but there's a large portion that we still can't explain. I think that's really interesting that, Mm -hmm. you know, even if women are working the same hours, if they've had the same experience, if they've, Mm -hmm. you know, have similar career kind of or job title Mm -hmm. or job Mm -hmm. level, that there is still a gender pay gap. Because I think the argument often used by people against a gender pay gap is that it comes down to hours. It comes down to productivity. You know, like I heard this one thing. (laughs) <laughs> Once I don't know where I heard it from, but it was like, of course, women make less than men. You know, men choose higher paying jobs like lawyer and doctor and CEO, and women choose lower paying mm-hmm. jobs like female doctor, female CEO, and female lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I guess it, it comes down to that analysis, because when you use the, the women data and you plug it into the men equation, there's still there's still a difference. Like that is the adjusted version of the gap. That's why we need to ask why there still exists a difference. Is it because women are like making different decisions than men? And if so, why? And then once we find out the why, then we can begin to ask questions like, are we all right with that? Like, is that a problem? Should we be making policy? But because there's such a portion of the gender pay gap that remains unexplained, we're still asking those questions. And I think one of the things that surprised me the most looking into this is like a lot of the papers that I found were very, very recent. This is a current (laughs) issue. Yes. (laughs) This is very much a present reality for women, you know, in different sectors. And I think something that would be interesting for us to talk about in this episode is we're both in fields that either historically or presently are considered male dominated. And what's the gender pay gap like in the fields we're in or going into? So this is a good question. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm not sure what the, the pay gap specifically is in data science, but I do know as a data scientist that like data is everywhere. And it's becoming more and more popular for companies to create these data science teams that look at their data so that they can have like predictive analytics and they can begin to use it to their benefit rather than just storing it and like keeping it gathering dust, for example. And we also talked about data science being like the sexiest job of the 21st century (laughs) by the Harvard Business Review. One of the things that's interesting is in data science, and this is coming from an article that I read, which is data science is booming, so where are the women? And I would agree that when I look around at the people who do the work that I do, I don't see a lot of people that look like me yet. Hmm. Even though there's a, a shortage of professionals who do the work that I do, there's still not that many women. Wow. And I mean, like if you think about the way data works, this in and of itself can create problems because if you have only one gender looking at data and doing the analysis, you will inherently introduce bias. Right. And I think the key in understanding that is that data analysis is not inherently gendered or biased, but the people doing the analysis can be whether consciously or unconsciously. Yeah, we bring our own bias to the table. And like once you include that bias in the data, it's difficult to remove it. How do you even begin to undo that? Number one, you probably don't know if you did. Also, you don't know to what extent. Like there's a lot of, like now we're starting to discuss these things where we discuss ethics and data science. But we're still trying to understand what are the consequences and what are the results of having 
a largely male-dominated field analyzing the data of many industries. Well, that's very interesting, too, because it hints towards the fact that it's far-reaching. It doesn't just affect women in data science. It affects all of the fields that rely on data science to make their decisions, to make new policies, to make hiring decisions, to so on and so forth. Exactly. I think um, I have a number from the article here. It says... In a 2020 report, global management consulting firm BCG reported that women make up just 15 to 22 percent of the workforce of data science. And I think what's funny, too, is sometimes numbers around that kind of 20 percent are actually publicized and put out there as being, wow, look at how many women are in (laughs) engineering or something. And it's like, (laughs) we still know that that's not 50 percent, (laughs) right? I don't necessarily, and this might be an unpopular opinion, I don't necessarily think we need to get 50-50 in every field. Yeah. But I do think that if you want to work in a field, we should work to remove the barriers that prevent you, irrespective of your gender, to working in that field. I think that's a good point. And I guess also something that I wanted to talk about a lot of these models, the genders that we're looking at are men and women, but we know that there are more genders than that now. Yeah. And I think that's a really important thing to put out there is gender isn't binary. And one of the things that is a problem is because we lack data, oftentimes on women, the data gap is even bigger for people who don't fit into the binary or identify as binary. I mean, this is kind of a shortcoming of data analysis, but like you need a lot of data in order to be accurate, accurate or precise. And when you think about gender, the easiest way to split that is men and women to have the most possible in the two groups. But when you begin to slice further, you begin to get less people in the groups, and then that becomes more difficult to come to conclusions. That's a really good point to bring up. When doing kind of the research for this episode, it's not that we wanted to only focus on the binary, but are constrained really by what's available. I mean, my hope is that as more of this analysis is done and there are there's research going on currently to like decompose that gap differently so that we can explain more. And hopefully we'll begin not only to explain more of the gap, but also to include more genders. Very important. So, Lindsay, we've talked about the gender pay gap and some of the mathematics that help us get to those calculations. And we talked about it in my field of work, data science. But what does it look like for you in medicine? Okay, so this is something I'm super excited to talk about. I knew you would be. (laughs) (laughs) Because I'm passionate about medicine and I'm also passionate about numbers. Mm -hmm. I'm a second year medical student in Canada, so not a doctor by any means, (laughs) but on the path path to be one. You will be a doctor. We need to say this with confidence. I am Lindsay (laughs) and I will be a doctor. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I never thought about gender discrimination in like any field I was thinking about going into. I never really thought about a gender pay gap in medicine. And I think that's a very common thing is we often don't think like, how can medicine have a gender pay gap, right? Mm -hmm. Because you do the same training, you do the same work. Yeah, like the fees charged for the services are the same for the individuals. Well, that's exactly it. And so I'll explain just a tiny bit about how physicians get paid in Canada just to provide some context to what we're talking about. So in Canada, we have universal health care. So the provinces and the territories pay physicians for the work that they do. Essential health care is provided at no cost to the patient and is funded by the government. So for physicians, there's a few different pay structures you can have. Some physicians, definitely the minority, are actually salaried. So an example is like most oncologists or cancer doctors have a salary model working with cancer centers, for example. The more common model for physicians is what's called fee for service. Okay. What this means is you as the physician bill the government for the services that you provide to the patient. 
So if you see 10 patients in a day, let's say you're a family doctor, you would bill the government for those 10 visits. And then also there's different things you can bill depending on what you do, right? So like a phone call versus in person or if you like Mm -hmm. provided an injection, so on and so forth. So basically your income is not fixed. It depends on what sort of services you provide and how how many services you provide. Hmm. And so for each thing, there's a different billing code, and this would differ province to province for how much each thing you get paid for. That's, I think, why it's so hard to wrap your mind around the fact that there's a gender pay gap in medicine, because it's not like, you know, when female physicians finish their residency training, which is training that has to happen after you graduate medical school and become an MD and a doctor and before you're allowed to practice independently. You know, it's not like you get a book that's, you know, 79 cents on the dollar compared to your male colleagues. The reality is that, yes, there is a gender pay gap in medicine. And unfortunately, it's actually one of the largest gender pay gaps of any field. Oh, I didn't know that. And that's mind blowing. And it also, it makes me, (laughs) it makes me a little angry. (laughs) Yeah, because I think about it and like, if you think of the journey that you have to go on to become a doctor, it's a very long path. So you do whatever you do before medical school. And then you do medical school, which in Canada is usually four years, but there's a few three year schools. And then you do two to five years of residency training in your field that you've chosen and you matched into. So you actually have to work quite hard in medical school to get to the field you want to be in. And then after that, it's optional, but you can do even more training, like one to, to two to sometimes four years of further training after residency in a certain area. So it ends up being a very long process. And it makes me very sad to think that at the end of that road, there still isn't parity in pay. Yeah, because it's such a long journey. Do we know what's causing that gap? Because you mentioned that the fees for the services are the same. Like, are there any ideas about what's causing the gender pay gap in the medical field? So that's what's so interesting is that it's a lot like the gender pay gap in general that we've been talking about, that some of it can be explained by certain things. And then some of it we also don't know. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So because we're in Canada, I'm going to focus on the numbers in Canada. Okay. An article was published in 2020 in the Canadian Medical Association Journal called Closing the Gender Pay Gap in Canadian Medicine. And what's important to note is that women in medicine consistently earn less than men. And that doesn't mean that every single woman in medicine earns less than men. Like looking at women on average, perhaps, would be a better way of thinking about it. Exactly. And the pay gap exists within every medical specialty. So no matter what specialty you go into, there isn't one that has no gender pay gap. Okay. This is a direct quote from the article because I thought it was very well said. The gender pay gap in medicine is not explained by women working fewer hours or less efficiently, but rather relates to systemic bias in medical school, hiring, promotion, clinical care arrangements, the fee schedule itself, and societal structures more broadly. Mm. So that kind of gets into what it you know, what might be causing it. But but the gender pay gap in medicine is quite high. So again, from this article, across the 10 specialties with the highest gross and net incomes, women made up to less than 35% than men. Like a third less than men in the 10 highest salaries in medicine. One of the issues too is that women accounted, this is again a direct quote, for 47%, 48%, and 62% of physicians in the three specialties with the lowest estimated net income. So that's family medicine at the 47%, psychiatry at 48%, and pediatrics at 62%. Okay, so not only is it that when they're in the high earners, they make less, in the proportion of physicians who are low earners, women are a higher fraction. Exactly. And so the Ontario Medical Association has done some work in this area to parse out what numbers are we looking at here. So male family physicians in Ontario earn 30% more and male specialists earn 40% more than their female counterparts. There's also costs to putting your personal life on hold. Women in medicine experience infertility at higher rates. You mentioned that the gap is caused by like systemic biases. 
Do we know what some of those biases are? Okay, so I'm going to kind of bounce around from a few different things because okay. there's been quite a few papers that have come up with maybe a few ideas that explain in part some mm-hmm. of the gap, but nothing fully explains it 100%. So I'll give you some different examples of things that factor into it. Gender distribution in surgical cases is a factor. Most OBGYNs or obstetricians and gynecologists, so um, doctors that deliver babies and then also handle the female reproductive system, they're mostly women. And then the, the flip side of that is urologists or doctors who handle specifically the male urogenital tract, but then also kidneys and things like that. So they do see some female patients as well, mostly male dominated. And There have been studies done that female surgeons are more likely to operate on female patients, and these procedures are often paid less than if the patient was a male. So in Ontario, to do an incision of a vulvar abscess under general anesthetic, so like under sedation, you get paid $50.90. Would you like to hazard a guess at how much you get paid (laughs) if it's a scrotal abscess under GA? I would say it's probably double. You're right on the money. (laughs) You get $99 to do that procedure. Yeah. Another example is to biopsy a lesion on a penis, you get paid $39.60. To biopsy a lesion on a vulva, you get paid $26.85. Okay. I'm a little fresh. Like, like why is it less? (laughs) I know. (laughs) Some of this is very much systemic, right? It's not this malicious thing. It's the way that this this billing structure is set up in some ways. And I think that's kind of like where we're at with the gender pay gap on a whole. Like it's not malicious. It's just a result of like cultural and systematic biases that exist in the systems. Absolutely. There is bias that comes in though. Okay. So in medicine, surgeons, for example, get referrals from primary care physicians. Yeah. So like if I come into my family doctor and I have an issue, she'll refer me to a surgeon if I need one. Exactly. And there has been evidence in the United States that there is a referral bias from primary care physicians that does contribute to the gender pay gap in surgery. I wonder if this kind of thing also happens outside of medicine. Like if you're in like another field and there's like a high profile project, I would be curious to see like what the referral rate of the high profile projects are to men versus women. We can also think of that in like uh, funding for grants for research. And there has been evidence that there are. There's some gender differences. Yeah. Specifically for referrals, there was a study done in 2017 using U.S. Medicare data. And what they found is that female surgeons received fewer referrals overall. And in surgery, there's always a risk of having a poor outcome or an adverse outcome. So if the patient did have a poor outcome after surgery and the surgeon was a woman, that primary care physician, whether male or female, was less likely to refer to any woman in that specialty. Oh. However, if it was a male surgeon, an equivalent drop in referrals to men was not seen. I see. So there's like more of a consequence as well on the women than the men. Yeah. And this was something that didn't 100% surprise me. I think it kind of comes back to if you're different in the field where you work, mistakes will seem larger because you, you're already, you already look different. So your mistakes are already kind of, your achievements and your mistakes for that matter are already kind of under a bit of a microscope. Yeah. You can't help but your work being viewed as like special to some degree because the person doing it is different from the Mm -hmm. rest of the group. I don't have any numbers to back that up. That is anecdotal, but that would be my intuition. (laughs) No, but it makes sense. And there's also um, further referral biases that feed into gender stereotypes. Women in medicine are more likely to have referrals for lower paid procedures. There's a lot of things at play. And I think one of the things I really want to emphasize is that it's not just a difference in how much women are working. Mm -hmm. And we we touched on this with kind of the gender pay gap as a whole, but I think it's especially important 
to mention in medicine because people often say, well, oh, well, like female physicians choose to work part time because they have a family. And while that may be true sometimes, that doesn't explain the gap. So for primary care physicians, this was a study done in BC in 2017. It showed that female primary care physicians made 36% less than their male colleagues, even though the patient care workload only differed by 3.2 hours a week. So it's, it's, the gap is disproportionate to any differences in hours in experience. It's unexplained, and I guess we're, we're still trying to figure out why. Yeah. Something that, that I found kind of encouraging was that there were quite a few articles about, like, well, what can we do about the gender pay gap? Yes, let's end on a happier note. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think really the first step is being aware of it. We need to address the structural biases. And we also really need men to be allies for us. I think, like you said, the first step is kind of just to understand that while we are closing the gap and we are understanding, like we're explaining some of the reasons why it exists, there's still a large portion of it that we don't understand why it's there. It's unexplained. That's the term that we use in the modeling. And Mm -hmm. I think it would benefit us all to begin explaining or to try to explain it. Yeah, because without knowing exactly what's contributing to it, we can't have a targeted approach or an evidence-based approach to fix it. All right, Lindsay, do you know what time it is? I think it's science seed time. It is. Each episode, we like to give our listeners something to think about, a science nugget to help you think more critically about the numbers, statistics, and really the science you hear every day. Uh, So, Lindsay, what are we talking about today? Okay, well, we've heard of the gender pay gap. Yes. But have we heard of the gender data gap? (laughs) Ah, yes. Yes. (laughs) So the gender data gap is something that I learned about through a book that I, I'm actually almost finished. I'm still reading it. It's a fantastic book. I recommend it to everyone. So it's called Invisible Women, Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. And it's written by Caroline Criado Perez. And it's a really fascinating book because it goes through all of these different areas of society where we're making decisions based on data that isn't disaggregated by sex. So it's not divided by, you know, we don't look differently at like, what are the transit patterns of, you know, how do women use public transit versus men? And Mm -hmm. when you start looking at sex disaggregated data, you start to realize that not always, but we can kind of bin a lot of things as like women using transit differently than men. So an example for that is men tend to have a more direct route on transit. Um, So it works really well in London, Mm -hmm. where the trains kind of go in like a wheel and spoke pattern, or sorry, the buses, like directly into town, whereas women are more likely to trip chain. Yeah, they make a lot of stops on the way. Exactly, because maybe they're dropping the kids off at school and picking up the dry cleaning and doing all those Mm -hmm. things so that it takes them disproportionately longer in a city like London to trip chain because the transit patterns are set up for that direct like commute, you go to the office, you come home. Obviously, there's people that break that mold across the gender spectrum, but there's these patterns that emerge that really indicate how the world is sometimes... I guess, I think the, the language that she uses in Invisible Women is the world in many ways is defaulted for men. Yes. And I think like a, a small example of that is like when you talk about, oh, did you catch the soccer game last night or football, I guess, if you're in the UK, <laughs> it's assumed that that's the men's soccer match. Yeah. Like when you said that, I, I was picturing the men's soccer game, not the women's soccer game. Because if you wanted to ask me about the women's soccer game, you would have said, did I catch the women's game last night? Yeah. I guess what we're trying to say is that the gender gap, it's not just in wage. It, it's everywhere. And we really want to challenge our listeners to see it because the first step is to see and identify it. And then we can start working on correcting. That is all for this episode. 
But if you have a burning question about what we talked about today or any of the other topics we have covered, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts with your question, and we just might answer it on our post-season two bonus episode of Listener's Questions. Thanks for listening, everyone. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you find your podcasts. You can find the references we use for this episode in our show notes. A special thank you to Julian Bertino, who does our sound editing and music. Want to learn more about what we talked about today? Follow us on Instagram at The Secret Life of Numbers. We'll catch you next time on The Secret Life of Numbers, where the numbers can run, but they can't hide. Thank you.